Hello everybody. Let's take a question and ask JP today. The question of today is Bharat from Hyderabad, Telangana. He is an operations research scientist. Bharat, go ahead. Namaskar, JP My name is Bharat. I'm an assistant of Hyderabad. My question is regarding recent uptick in encounters by police department in few states in our country. Is there a place for such things in a democratic country? If not, what can be done to prevent such things? Second, what is your take on death penalty? Thank you, Bharat. A very important question. A democracy is only namesake but not real, unless every citizen, irrespective of caste, economic status, gender, religion, language, and background, enjoys the same rights in real terms, and enjoys the same protection of the law in real terms. And nobody is above law. All are treated equally in law. We don't have those conditions. We have only normative rule of law. We have no sense of justice for the weak and the poor, either criminal justice or civil justice. And might has become right. So people are vexed. So if encounters take place in Disha case or in some other case in the country, and there are so many instances in our state and other states across the country where people are clamoring for street justice, lynching, because they feel genuinely hurt, angry, fearful, when there is a brutal torture of a young girl or a mass rape or a brutal murder or some other serious and heinous violation of their rights, then society reacts. When the legal system and justice system are not capable of handling it effectively, efficiently and in a satisfactory manner, then people clamor for lynching and street justice. What do we do about that? Obviously, that's not the answer. If we allow might to prevail, whether it's the might of the policeman or might of the fellow with a gun or lottie, then not only is it wrong constitutionally and legally and morally, it's actually wrong in a practical sense. Today, the encounter may be against a genuine culprit who deserves no sympathy from us. But the reason why even the culprit's right should be respected and he or she must be tried in the due process of law. And then, after due punishment in a lawful manner is imposed, that punishment must be carried out. It's necessary because today they may have acted against a truly heinous human being. But tomorrow there is no guarantee that if this kind of power is given to a policeman wielding a lottery or a gun, there is no guarantee that you and I will not become victims. World over, throughout history, umpteen number of times, this kind of power was inevitably abused. Initially, it appears to be expedient, convenient, nice. But in the long term, it goes against political opponents. It goes against personal enemies. It goes against people who did not yield to your unreasonable demands. There are so many instances like that during emergency, when extreme power was given to the executive branch of government. Many, many unspeakable barbarities happened and people's rights were extinguished. So it's not so much for morality or constitution, it's also to protect all of us, the innocent people. The assumption that the policemen will use that power always for the good of the people is a dangerous and nonsensical assumption. Therefore, we have to respect the policemen, give them adequate tools to carry out their responsibilities, but we have to have adequate safeguards to protect the citizens. And that's what rule of law is. And that's why we always want to make sure that the justice system is different. There is a justice system. There is a court system that will determine what is right and wrong. That will determine the guilt and punish. And the police role is investigating, gathering evidence. The role of the prosecution is to present the evidence in a court of law and ensure that the culprit actually gets the just deserts awarded the punishment so that the society is protected. And unless we do it efficiently, there will be always this clamor. The reason why people are vexed in our country is the enormous delays in criminal and civil justice system. 
a case takes years and sometimes decades. Even the murder of a prime minister by terrorists took 18 years for the sentence to be carried out. 18 years. In a case where there is no dispute about who has done it, evidence was incontrovertible. Our procedures have become very dilatory. We have problems at the police investigation level. Forensics virtually non-existent, oftentimes to use third degree to extract confession through coercion and force. Prosecution is very weak and inefficient and very, in most cases, simply unconcerned about protecting the society and punishing the culprit. The procedures are extremely old-fashioned and absurd in some cases, cause enormous delays and expense. And the courts themselves have many, many inadequacies, including the infrastructure in the courts and the inadequacies in terms of the numbers and the quality of judges. We have to address each of these things. But when it comes to abuse of power by the police forces, unlawful use of force against individuals, no matter what the provocation, you have to have an independent crime investigation division of the police, an independent prosecutor wing, totally away from the control and the influence of the political executive and the bureaucratic executive independent, but held to account by a quasi-judicial body with judges and other eminent people handling that. You know, the Administrative Forms Commission, the report on public order, we went into great lengths about how to sequence it, not only about what needs to be done, but how to do it in a structured and sequential manner. How to find the ratio, the balance between the interests of many, the interests of the accused, the interests of the society at large and the victims, the interests of justice, interests of state, we have to balance all these interests. And unless we have that kind of mechanism, an intricate mechanism of both empowerment and accountability, so the speedy and efficient justice are actually possible and people get a confidence, a sense of confidence that for a crime there will be punishment, that justice is available. It's not inaccessible, it's not in, uh, frightfully expensive, it's not delayed. Only that confidence will make sure that there is no Kangaroo justice. There is no lynch mob mentality. There are no fraudulent encounters. But we must also look at the other facet. There's so much a mistrust of police in our country. We're not even giving them the legitimate role in crime investigation. For instance, India is perhaps the only civilized country where because of mistrust of the police, a statement recorded by the police is not admissible as evidence. There's almost no other country where such a thing happens. You may bring a witness to challenge the statement or whatever, but you give the power of life and death, power of crime investigation, extremely serious cases to the police officer, but you don't trust a statement recorded by them, have adequate safeguards, but trust them. You mistrust them, don't give them the tools, and then attack them. It's not really helping anybody. Similarly, in extreme cases, let's take the Punjab terrorist threat or some other terrorist or secessionist threats, violent groups, organized groups, undermining the constitution of India or the integrity and unity of this country. Obviously, strong action is called for to protect the unity of India. The society or the state expect that, but you don't give the tools to the police officials and you expect them to violate the law operate outside the four corners of law and then kill people in captivity and then you want to blame them or you want to eulogize them or glorify them. That doesn't help. If indeed certain situations warrant greater latitude to the policeman, for instance, if there is a serious incident that's likely to happen, a bomb is going to be exploded and hundreds of people may die or be seriously injured and a person who is being interrogated actually has real information. Perhaps there is a case to look at a different way of treating such uh, persons in interrogation. You cannot say you have a right to remain silent and there's nothing that the policeman can do, let hundreds die. So unless we also create a legal mechanism which suits the requirements of the society and the state to protect the society, even as 
there is a fair balance in protecting the accused. If you only look at the accused all the time, even in the face of grave provocation, then what's happening? People anyway are violating the injunction of law. They're beating, or beating them to a pulp, applying third degree, torture, sometimes even killing them. And that we are keeping quiet. That's a very dangerous situation. So we have to really reorganize the way the crime investigation and the rule of law in operators are structured. And there are ways of doing it. Foundation for Democratic Reforms has done an enormous amount of work about what needs to be done, how to do it in a fair and balanced manner, what is the sequence of things to be done so that it does not become disruptive of society. So if there is a will, there's a way of doing it. Unfortunately, in our society right now, none of the political formations are committed to rule of law. The complaints you hear are only about the a ruling party at a point of time in a geography, in a state or at the union, abusing the process of law and therefore complaints without any commitment to end the abuse. All that they're saying is, let us come to power, we'll do that now to you. That is not rule of law. There is no serious commitment to rule of law in our political system. We have to restore that commitment. And the people must realize that law is to protect all of us. And if unfair use of power, third degree, torture, or so-called encounter, killing people in captivity, or allowed for short-term expediency, tomorrow you and I will be the victims. There will be no protection to the honest citizen. That's exactly the reason why the Constitution and the laws provided for these protections. But where required in extreme situations, let's have more flexible but fully accountable systems in place so that if you cannot have extreme degree of liberty when you're protecting the nation's integrity or the lives of hundreds of people, then let things happen in a transparent way, in an accountable way, rather than an illegal way, an accountable way. That is my take. Now, regarding death penalty, ideally, there should be no death penalty. But we live in a society far from ideal. Therefore, in extreme situations, perhaps death penalty is called for. In my view, the Indian ratio, both in law and by the court pronouncements and in, act, in actual practice, that is applied in the rarest of rare cases. Just because some offense is a capital punishment, capital offense, you do not automatically impose the capital punishment on those offenses. But look at the circumstance in each case. And then after awarding death penalty also, you have the safeguards, the higher courts, the constitutional courts examining in each case. I think it's a fairly reasonable system as long as you make it faster. You make it work. But an extreme situation of imposing death penalty on all and sundry because they are capital offenses is totally inhumane, not in keeping with modern thinking and practices. And I believe that nobody deserves to be uh, put to death, no matter how heinous their offense is, perhaps is not also a, a very desirable thing in the current social and political realities. And I think Indian practice and Indian jurisprudence is reasonable. And I would go along with that until there is a need for and the case for changing that.